<laughs> well, uh, when when I was asked to uh, join you today, you know, I guess uh, one of the things that came to mind is, you know, what do you do day to day now with, you know, this past year especially, right, being remote and uh, and and just, you know, really the we're so lucky, right, to work in this industry where things are still very busy, I think, for, for many people. Uh, so it's fortunate, but I think the downside is, of course, we have too much to do. And a lot of that is just the, you know, companies that are still focusing on their transformation um, from, you know, on-premise to cloud, for example, right? And, and trying to uh, maybe improve their overall architecture position, uh, maybe lift and shift, maybe uh, encapsulate and erode uh, monolithic code or things that are, um, uh, you know, difficult to advanced business features, deliver quickly, rapidly, you know, business value acceleration obviously is a big goal for folks these days, right, to be competitive and stay competitive. So um, definitely that's the, the thing that's near and dear to me in almost everything that I do as part of our business. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the topic we chose. So I think, I mean, <laughs> Obviously, I, I, I'm not as experienced as you, but I, I, I do a little bit of cloud consultancy here and there. I encounter microservices quite a lot as a term that my customers throw at me, but they don't necessarily know what it is they mean by microservices. How about maybe you could kick us off with a definition of what you think microservices is, and maybe a little bit of a, of a contextual description of where you think it's an appropriate um, approach to take? So that, that, what's interesting about that is uh, I'm sure everybody will describe microservices uh, slightly differently because, well, because you read a lot about it uh, from different perspectives. So my view of the whole strategy around microservices is really that you're, you're trying to be more agile and focused with everything that you deliver. Uh, to your overall solution, right? So the number one thing I feel like people are trying to achieve with microservices is acceleration um, and also remove complexity of the intertwining aspects of a typical system that you may have built in the past. So when you think about microservices, you think typically about breaking down business capabilities. You know, how do we break down this whole organization into groups of functionality that people can focus on as a team. And that sometimes is just a few small things. You know, when I think about um, a typical company, right, you're going to have an area that's focused on identity uh, because everybody has to deal with identity and that's a domain, right? That's a business capability and many things go under that domain like membership and account management and credentials and single sign-on, right? That whole space. And then you'll also have whatever your business is about, right? Is it products and orders and fulfillment, you know? Uh, is it, uh, you know, insurance and policies and memberships and events or, uh, you know, investments? It, it could be any number of things. So at that point now we're into your business domain. But breaking it down at that top high level starts to help people focus. And then you get these groups together to further break down, how do we look at it from a business value, business functionality, business capability within that domain and then you start thinking about the microservices that support that so all that's very abstract and you can do a straw man of the high level up front to help guide the business but you're never going to break down every single domain into all of its microservices in you know up front right that's not extremely agile so at some point we have to take that high level view that you know domain taxonomy if you will and start turning it into what are the things that we're trying to deliver now right what are the um, the most impactful things we can accelerate to deliver value to the customer uh, obviously gain revenue uh, you know help the business to operate and and succeed and so you know, within each domain, there will be priorities and you'll have folks that are prioritizing which thing will deliver the best value. So now we need the technical way to get that done. So we have to think about what's our platform, 
Um, are we, you know, net new cloud, maybe an Azure foundation, and we're, you know, tearing things out of the on-premise? Are we connecting to on-premise directly from the database perspective with an express route, for example, to be secure? Or are we thinking about maybe APIs at the on-premise that we will communicate with to extract and bring maybe system of interest into the cloud, right? So there's that concept as well. Um, and then the other is obviously to just move system of record into cloud for compartmented areas within a domain. So there's all these different strategies that will come up, but they need a platform to operate on, right? You need a architecture strategy for each of those things and, and others. Uh, and I find that, you know, you, you, you have to go into it with what is the requirement of the business, compliance, regulatory, security, separation of duties, all of those things can be very important for setting up your platform. So I, I've seen companies where we do a lot of platforming up front with proof of technology approach where you take a few business value gains and deliver those, but you spend the majority of the year on just building out this you know, amazing platform that you can deliver quickly to. And you get your patterns, your practices, your Azure DevOps, CI, CD, um, all the security, you know, um, analysis that goes into the pipeline. Delivery to, let's say, AKS, right? Um, understanding what do we need inside AKS for general compartmentalization, authorization, security, access to data, you know, access to on-premise, um, getting all that baked, your, your network routing, how you get all that into, say, Terraform or ARM and deliver quickly and get these patterns going so that when the next group comes and you start flushing out all these domains, you can land it quickly because you've built these patterns. Um, so, so that's like a, an extreme level of uh, specificity that you might uh, uh, handle up front to ensure that you can go fast later, right? Um, but I've also seen the other side where, you know, there are organizations out there that are, you know, embracing agile to the point of maybe each team gets to choose their own technology. So you've got, you know, maybe a little bit of healthy chaos. Uh, where some folks decide they want to use API management and functions and then others are, you know, using AKS um, to, to deliver and others are using app services and, you know, they're really deciding based on their domain and what they're trying to deliver and what their team knows, how to get it done. Um, so the benefit of that is acceleration, rapid delivery, but you reach a point after that where you actually need to take a step back and say, okay, something unhealthy is going on now. Um, everybody's, you know, firing events and they're saying, I've got a topic, you can consume it. And I've got another one and you can consume that. Uh, and there's no overall overarching architecture supervision or governance, right? So I've seen that happen where that's healthy in the beginning and becomes chaotic. So now we have to reverse engine or, re you know, take a step back and try to build that platform and those consistencies and those practices and that governance. and. Um, I'm saying a lot of things here because I guess there's different experiences that, you know, over these years, uh, you know, our company is involved with. And I think both has its value um, and it's sort of cultural within the organization. Do you want to, you know, kind of prevent lessons learned up front and get those platforms and practices done up front and take longer? Are you okay with that as a business? Can you fund that? Or do we need to see acceleration, quick value, delivery, you know, use paths as much as possible, get things done, and then turn it into, you know, the governance that you need after you've seen all that value and gained the initial business lift you needed, so. Um. Yeah, really interesting and it makes a lot of sense and a lot of insight. Um, yeah, so do you commonly find that development teams need to change their practices, successfully build and maintain microservice architecture, and what are those changes um, truly? When you say, uh, do they need to change their practices, do you mean, uh, are you sort of pointing at what I stated around, you know, lessons learned and what yeah. you want to do now? Certainly that can happen. Uh, I think that folks can learn, for example, um, I've worked in some organizations where we've 
you know, set up, you know, AKS clusters and you've got all of your platform, you know, well-defined and, you know, uh, traffic manager, front door, WAF, um, AKS, you know, backend, Cosmos, SQL, depending on the microservice domain, uh, communication with events, communication with on-prem, and you have all these moving parts and you've built these practices, but then you start learning as you bring new teams on that maybe not everybody uh, is picking up the practices as well as another, right? So it's harder for them to, you know, follow how do I stand up a new ASP.NET Core API in this platform and um, instrument it, put the telemetry that's needed, put the API management tooling, uh, sorry, uh, uh, you know, uh, standards around the, the API uh, contracts, let's say, um, you know, integration with database, patterns and practices that help you do it right and securely to reduce the need the, reduce the need for code reviews uh, that might surface, you know, uh, more problems. And so when we run into that, actually, one thing that's been really successful has been using CodeGen. So using uh, like a swag or CodeGen tool and building mustache files that actually output the initial ASP.NET Core foundational host and the models uh, that match the contract. So you build your YAML contract up front, you do an API contract first approach to your microservices and generate foundational code that actually fast tracks new team members as you're building you know, many, many microservices across many teams, hundreds of developers, so very large organization style. This becomes really beneficial because now your telemetry is in place, your you know, API security is in place, the standards around things that people don't all know, uh, and you're, you're, you're trying to get them some lift off. So that's a one lesson learned that I think was advantageous um, in organizations that are really large. Um, another example would be uh, sometimes it's just nice to stand up a function, right? Um, and maybe we don't always need that single pane view of all of our, you know, domain microservices within, you know, the container monitoring window, if you will. Um, maybe not every single thing needs to be, you know, a container, right? It could be we're moving into, you know, some functions just, you know, we have a standard for managing our functions. Maybe that is putting it behind API management um, and that helps you with some standards there uh, to, to at least make it, again, manageable while still being agile, right? You need patterns so that you don't have complete chaos and everybody's just doing what they want and flicking things out there. Um, but, um, but, you know, that doesn't mean we always have to do everything one way. Okay. So everything you've been, been talking about so far, Michelle, you, you've mentioned so several teams working together, everything sort of felt like this is a, a large organization solution. Is Microsoft, it, not Microsoft, ha, is microservices an approach that's really aimed at enterprise, aimed at those huge software solutions with lots of moving parts, or is this something that scales down as a good practice to smaller shops? It, it scales down, um, you know, when you, obviously the interesting problem to solve is the very large organization problem because that's where you need more discipline, more governance, more structure uh, around your practices to allow for visibility to leadership about the health of the whole system, right, on both the platform side and the business delivery side. and. Uh, and that's extremely important, obviously. Um, but when you think about in general microservices, we're really talking about breaking down your problem. So if I have a smaller product, um, you know, I might only have uh, one or two domains in there, right? Um, and at the end of the day, I'm essentially really just breaking down problems into usually API contract first is a good way to look at it, right? Um, I need this set of functionality, I'm gonna expose it through APIs and I'm gonna build some UIs in front. Maybe I have one UI in a smaller organization and that one UI talks to all the APIs and I'm done. And you know, that's my whole system. Um, so, you know, now we got to think about productivity. So in a case where it's not a huge organization with, you know, 20 million users, you know, maybe, maybe I can just manage that with app services and, you know, 
deliver it with a container could be helpful in app services just because then locally you've got this development, this containment of all the dependencies of the service that you're running, the API or the UI. Uh, but at the end of the day, again, I'm leveraging paths wherever possible so that I have less to manage, um, you know, in general from an operational perspective. And I can focus on making my logs better, um, making my security story better, uh, building great dashboards to visualize health, right, and get alerts when something's down. So I can, you know, remove some of the other overhead by leveraging paths all over. And Azure is extremely, you know, good at at paths. True, there's a lot of power power in, in Azure Paths, definitely. So, um, continuing from there, kind of, is microservices synonymous with containerization, or should the two be viewed as separate things? Uh, they're re they're really separate things, right? So, microservices is more of a discipline, um, a set of practices around how you uh, define business capabilities and you know, isolate the components that deliver those business capabilities so that you can update this capability without affecting that one. And therefore those teams or those individuals can in, you know, in, a, in parallel be operating uh, and delivering quickly when needed. Uh, so imagine those times when you have a uh, large monolithic application and everybody's afraid to touch that one line of code because they don't know all the places it's touched, right? So, so a lot of times when we do migrations or transformations of a code base, that's the number one problem is either the code is no longer known or understood by anybody, or it, the one person that understood it left the company, uh, or you know it's understood, but nobody really knows the whole picture. So we have to now figure out all the touch points so that we can actually make the transformation toward a microservice architecture. So the idea is that by breaking it down into those smaller, you know, uh, delivery components, you no longer have that complexity. So complexity is the enemy of security. Complexity is the enemy of productivity um, and handoff. And it's the enemy of what happens when that person that wrote that beautiful piece of code that was so, you know, sophisticated is no longer there. It's, it, you know, that theme is uh, probably lives in many things we do, but with microservices, the theme is at the component level. But we, we need that manageable amount of work that is, you know, demystifying what am I doing here and make it quickly to deliver. And then, you know, how I deliver it, if it's in a container or in a function or, you know, in a controller, like an API app, uh, you know, doesn't matter, right? It's still that isolation, that logical isolation. So I was smiling because there, there was a picture of Magnus popped up there, who's obviously lurking that. the live stream questions. That's really Hi, awesome. Magnus. Right. Nice to see you too. Without his lockdown hair. So, Michelle, um, one of the things you were talking about a few minutes ago, and I think that sort of same, connects nicely to what you were just saying about um, you know people leaving, dealing with legacy code. You mentioned governance, and I see this a lot where organisations don't necessarily think about governance until it's too late and the horse has bolted. Um, you said that one of the, the, the ways that organisations could tackle microservices is, is that they could, if you like, start be quite agile and then retrofit some of those patterns and practices. How do you how do you balance that um, effectively with the need for enough cloud governance to make sure you're not just building a bigger rope to hang yourself with? So that is a cultural thing per organization, and that has to come from leadership. Um, if leadership enables all the teams to be autonomous and choose what they like, that will grow until somebody says something's out of control here. Um, and maybe that's okay because the point that you reach that, maybe you now have a data problem down there, right? Like just there's there's just a mess of things going on and, and, and nobody's really tried to tie it together. Or maybe you have a messaging problem where, you know, this thing we thought we were doing for eventual consistency where all the systems were up to date, it's been not well planned, so we're finding that things aren't quite as consistent as we want. Those, those are big problems to solve 
So you're right, if you don't catch that early enough in the game and start planning for where do we want to land um, from an overall standardization perspective and overall target architecture perspective, um, if you don't have that vision, that target, you can get into a mess to where you have a bigger problem to solve and everybody has to assemble around that one problem until it's fixed and now we can start fresh, right? Um, I don't know how to tell people not to let it get there because again, it's cultural. You're, 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 you have to have people that are working in the teams that care enough outside of the work they're just doing. And, and this is a bad habit I always had, which is I'd be owning this area of work, but I wanted to understand everything. So I would try to figure out how does this come in and who are all the folks that call this? And then I would care. Uh, about the UI or, or about some other experience and start asking questions. So if you're curious, right, you tend to know more about overall things and then you're the one that might be the person that learns something's not working out here. I think we have a potential problem. So then you can be the one that raises that, you know, to other architects, other team members and your voice is heard. Um, the other way is obviously leadership realizes we've got a problem and they are, you know, obviously uh, in tune with the fact that we need a strategy, right? So, you know, uh, most good leaders will realize we need a strategy and they'll balance strategy and investment in that with delivery of business value quickly to ensure that, you know, the business is meeting their commitments, uh, whether it's, you know, large company meeting commitments for Wall Street so that, you know, your stock stays at a level or whether it's just meeting commitments to customers because that's going to keep you in business, you know, as a smaller business. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to type questions for Annie and you've beaten me to it. OK, I'll ask you myself. So, um, so when you, you're looking then at uh, um, organizations and they're starting to talk to you about their requirements, what are the words that you listen for that make you think, ah, this is probably a good fit for microservices or no, wait, this isn't a good fit for microservices? Are, are, there, are there sort of, I don't know, dog whistles, to, to use not a great phrase, that, that, that let you latch on to, to where it might be an, a, an appropriate approach? So I, I don't know that there are trigger words for we need microservices. I think that if you're a solution or enterprise architect uh, and you are working with a company on what they need, you don't really lead with we need a microservices solution. You lead with what is the business solution? What are the domains and capabilities regardless? So you might argue that's something everybody should do anyways. It, it is a thing that's tied to microservices in terms of conceptually, that's where we hear that discussed the most. But imagine every solution needs to have this compartmentalization of functions and functionality, um, business capabilities again, right? Um, so that you can team put teams behind it and focus behind it. And, you know, again, business value for the customer uh, go, ties together with that. So you're going to do that anyways. Um, what I'm listening for more is how do we accelerate your delivery of things the business needs to the market. So I look for what kind of, I guess, tolerance the business has for investing in a foundation. Uh, if they have tolerance and dollars to invest in that foundation, and they can keep their existing wheels on over here while you build the net new foundation for moving new over, right? Um, you know, moving system of record over here into the cloud, let's say, by building these, you know, microservices that start solving problems. So think about a net new features, fit for purpose UIs and APIs that connect data that was in the old legacy system and start moving system of record to cloud, typical strategy. So we're, we're looking for what's gonna give the business the greatest value. And we're looking for what areas and domains um, is the business comprised of so that we can figure out what are your priorities? Cause you can actually do a prioritization of the domains and that's something we typically do with the microservices, um, you know, larger strategy approach, right? Right up front, you know, you look at business domains, capabilities, 
and then you prioritize them. So that way you know if we're doing a long four-year migration, which domains do we start with first that will give the business the most impact? I probably didn't answer your question though. <laughs> no, no, you did. I, 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 it's interesting. It, so, sorry, I, I'm off on a tangent again. But so no. often, you know, customers start with, a, I've heard these buzzwords. I think we ought to be doing this. A consultant has said we should do. Mm. And as a practitioner, sometimes that worries me. And it's like, okay, well, let's go through your needs and requirements and, and let me validate that. Um, and oftentimes, simply helping those customers with it. If you hear this, then you should think this. If you hear this, you should think this. I think that, that really helps to sort of level set. Um, Annie, you've got a, a, a question to ask though, I know. Yes, uh, yes, uh, there's a really interesting discussion and I think we all can go a bit of on a tangent, but really happy to ask uh, a question as well. So what is a typical solution for embracing microservices usually? So specifically, there's a major struggle on understanding the domain in terms of software architecture. So what is the best way to embrace a microservices based architecture considering the natural desire de developers have to over centralize data, configuration and even the business logic? So I think what that question is trying to say is how do developers get engaged in understanding how we isolate business capabilities so that we don't lead towards that you know single monolithic database at the back um, or code base and again this is often not driven by the developers uh, if the organization has architecture leadership there's going to be a combined team, right? You need the DevOps people, the developers, the, the you know architects, and you need business owners that understand the stakeholders and the customers. Uh, those, that's the full team for a microservice domain. Um, so if you're you know trying to understand how do I avoid building that monolithic backend, it really does still start with understanding if we compartmentalize these business capabilities, they can own their own data. Uh, the other standard would be a microservice always owns its own data. What does that mean? It doesn't mean I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have one shared platform inter infrastructure probably for, you know, event hubs and, uh, you know, AKS and, you uh, uh, SQL paths, for example, right, and Cosmos. What I'm going to end up doing, though, is the actual tables or possibly database instances are my isolation point for, you know, I own this data. So if you think as a developer around, you know, identity, I do a lot of work in the identity space, has its own set of data that it cares about, right? Users, uh, relationship of users to external identity providers, maybe a small light profile, MFA, credential profiles, things like that. Um, and it has APIs for user management and self-service UIs for set my password. And then it's got, you know, login and SSO. So that's, you know, a domain capability and a small set of microservices, but the bundle, right? And that may, you know, share one backend because they could be looked at as a unit of, of delivery. And then you'll have membership, like my accounts in the system. And so often identity links to accounts, but that's like a separate concept. So I'm gonna have my own tables for that and I'm gonna relate that to a user somehow. So that's just a relationship between two domains referentially. But, you know, I own my own data over here. Accounts should not blend over here. So I only have one credential profile, but maybe I have a membership profile over here with my address and my contact and my membership details for that company, whatever the business is. And if I think that way, now I can isolate my data and my backend and I can isolate my API contracts and the ownership of those things. And at that point, now we get into I can have developer teams architecting those individual areas and now I need a solution architecture picture and team that understands how they all go end to end because at some point the front is going end to end. I might have shared UIs with pieces that go to each domain. I might have, you know, uh, integration stories that traverse these APIs. So I need to understand, you know, the data prep needed for testing that and, and how does it relate to each other and so on. Um, Hopefully that was helpful.
Yeah, really a lot. Um, I think there's two questions from the audience. Let's see if we have time for, for both of them, but let's start with one of them. So in, in a microservices based architecture, does the team end up becoming micro too? It does. You usually do have domain teams. So, you know, let's think of a scrum team as being a domain team. Uh, some domains are big enough to have multiple scrum teams for that domain. So uh, I have some large organizations I work with where we have right now, uh, you know, two dedicated identity domain teams because identity is big. Um, and then maybe there's, you know, three on this other domain and two on this other domain, right? Again, large organization, lots of product considerations and capabilities. Um, so that's one way to look at it. But then I have other companies where it's like one team per domain. Perfect. And I think we just and just have time for the last uh, question from the audience. Oh, there's even more coming, but let's <laughs> let's start with that one. So, uh, since you mentioned DevOps, are you suggesting that devs should now be responsible for infrastructure as a code uh, and become more uh, OP in a way, or that ops should then become more uh, developer-like? I I think that. It's going to depend, obviously, but what you should have for security reasons, typically, as well as separation of duties, if you need that in your org, is a platform team that sets up the foundation, right? You know, traffic manager, AKS, you know, Azure WAF, um, you know, SQL uh, in general, like the setup for disaster recovery and high availability and, you know, multiple regions and all of those things are set up by the platform team. But your domain team needs to have the ability to terraform or arm deliver into, you know, that platform. So I need to know how to deliver uh, my API service uh, in a container uh, with the right you know, um, pipeline to put it into AKS and have the correct key vault, service principles, uh, managed identities that can call to the right database and so on, right? So I have this, you know, vertical slice of things that I own as a de domain developer or team, and I need to deliver it to a platform that has set some standards and gates for security and, and platform delivery. So in a more formal environment, those would be two isolated things. And then what you have is, uh, again, reusable practices that hopefully mean a pipeline's up in a day, right? Um, I stood up my host for the API container with some code gen in you know, an hour or two. And now I'm just talking about business value from there. What are the actual designs and schemas and things? Um, so what I would expect is that the whole domain team can monitor that and own it in production. That's the way that most of the organizations today are working because you can't scale understanding how to fix problems in production. You need to be the team that owns that code, which means you can't just put it on the SRE and have just one SRE responsible, right? Everybody on the team should learn a little bit about how to monitor, look at Azure App Insights, end-to-end uh, -end trace values, you know, dashboards that help us understand what's going on. Every time you solve a problem, look at it and say, hmm, what logs or alerts could have helped me with that? Let's build that now. Or what dashboard would have shown me that more easily? Um, and if you're always looking to that and improving as a team, then you can monitor that yourself. So ideally, everyone is a bit full stack there, but there is some limit, right? Everybody won't be an Angular developer or a React developer. Um, and maybe those folks aren't ASP.NET Core API developers or Node.js developers. So there's going to be skill sets, right? But you should all be able to at least deal with the post delivery into Azure. You know, what do I have out there? How do I understand it's healthy? Everybody should understand that so that you can help out. For sure. I think it, it, it's good that everyone can help out uh, whenever necessary. So. A quick shout out to um, Luna, Gus, Magnus, and Andre and Alex who asked who have asked questions. So much appreciated. Love it when when people are engaging with the session. Um, we have two minutes left. Do you Rick think that we have time for the last question, or should we kick to the next speaker? How do you think? I think if Michelle can try and answer that question quickly, a it'll be very interesting. Pressure's on. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So. 
um, and I'll thank Alex for this, the, the, the Global Azure Pixies are feeding his questions from the back, which is great. Microservices lend themselves nicely um, to APIs, being used with APIs. But do you see microservices implemented in front ends as well? Well, it's all part of the domain. So you will have a, you know, microservices and APIs, you know, those are the core business functionality, it's true. But you still need uh, sometimes micro UIs that are, you know, fit for purpose to a particular area. So I'll give you an example. Some organizations have 200 spas and they're all subdomained or routed and that gives the team autonomy for building their little piece and then there's a common header right and common functionality around it and some folks like to do the mono repo approach to delivering that although that's got a lot of uh, complexity and it's hard to do well so if you don't really invest in it you can do that really badly so i usually recommend we don't do that um, and you know each of those Again, micro UIs are part of the microservice domain and business capability they're part of. Another way to approach it is you do that for some things, but other things could be a combined platform application that have areas that are owned by teams for their business capability. And they deliver it so that it kind of stitches up into a platform team's owned delivery of the application as a whole. So it's kind of one host, but your piece could be tested individually and then stitched up into that host. So uh, I still look at it like micro UIs in the sense, uh, in, and you know, that's, that's just part of keeping the business capability owned by the team that understands that business domain, right? Perfect. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, our time is, time is starting to be up, but it's been super interesting. And thank you so much for, for speaking and visiting us here at Global Azure Stream. Uh, it has been very lovely. And thank you so much for, for you. taking the time.